Today we're going to talk about the Pythagorean Theorem. The Pythagorean Theorem says if a triangle has a right angle such that C is the side opposite the right angle, which we call the hypotenuse, then the sum of the squares of the other two sides, A and B, is equal to the square of C. More easily, I can see A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. It's really important that C is written by itself on one side of the equation and that the other two sides, which are the base and the height, are on the opposite side. So let's take some examples. In this example, I have all three sides of the triangle already given, but what I want you to see is the relationship between the two sides. So I have 3 squared plus 4 squared, so this is the base and the height, is equal to 5 squared, which is the hypotenuse. Just to show you that works, 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16, and that gives me 25. It may be of interest for you to know that there are things called Pythagorean triples. These are integer solutions to the Pythagorean theorem, like the 3, 4, 5 that we just did. Another one is 5, 12, 13. The 5 squared plus 12 squared is equal to 13 squared. Again, let's write that out. 5 squared is 25, 12 squared is 144, and that's equal to 13 squared, which is 169. A lot of times when we try to complete a Pythagorean in theorem problem, we'll find that we don't get integers, which is fine. We're going to get um, irrational numbers. That's okay. We're going to end up writing them as decimals, but I just wanted you to see this in case it helps you to start recognizing some patterns that are going to happen in your homework and when you're dealing with triangles. What's really helpful, I think, though, is that once a triple occurs, like 3, 4, 5, multiples of the triple also work. So say I took 3, 4, 5, and I multiply them by 2 which is 6, 8, 10, 6 squared plus 8 squared is 10 squared is also a Pythagorean triple. Notice 6 squared is 36, 8 squared is 64, and that adds up to 10 squared, which is 100. So maybe if you notice these in your homework, you may be able to do it quicker, but it always, um, you can do it the, the long way too. So let's find the value of C. This time I have 12, 16, and C. So I have 12 squared plus 16 squared is equal to C squared. 12 squared is 144. 16 squared is 256. That's going to give me C squared. I added 144 to 256 that gave me 400. And then I'm just going to take the square root of both sides to get 20. When you do the square root, there's no plus or minus. If you're remembering that from previous classes that you took maybe in high school, we don't do that in, in this kind of um, subject of geometry because I can't have a negative side. So I end up just getting 20. Also notice that I first square before I add. So I'm never going to add 12 and 16 and get 20 and then square it. I want to separately square 12, separately square 16, and then add them together. Looking at this triple that we got, um, 12, 16, 20, we do notice they all have 4 in common. Notice that 12 is 4 times 3, 16 is 4 times 4, and 20 is 4 times 5. So there's that 3, 4, 5 Pythagorean triple hidden inside of it. If we had a seen it to begin with, that if we saw that 12 was 3 times 4, and 16 is 4 times 4, we could have guessed that C would have been 4 times 5. So let's do it again. This time I have find the hypotenuse, but this is with an isosceles triangle. I have two sides that are the same. I have 4 and 4. It doesn't really change anything. That's just interesting to talk about. So 4 squared, 16, plus 4 squared, 16 will be C squared. 16 and 16 is 32. Now this time, when I take the square root, I'm not going to get a nice number. I'm going to get a decimal. That's perfectly okay. So we're going to take the square root of 32, and let's say we go ahead and put two decimal places in. I have 5.6. Um, it says 5, 6, 8, so I'm just going to round that up and make that 6, 6. The Pythagorean theorem works when trying to find any side of a right triangle. I don't have to be looking for the hypotenuse, but in this particular case, I'm looking for the height. I want to make sure I set it up the correct way though, that I still have x squared and 15 squared on one side and the hypotenuse is isolated on the other side. 
I'm going to start by squaring things. I can't do anything with the x squared, but 15 squared is 225. 17 squared is 289. So I want to subtract 289 minus 225, which gives me 64. Take the square root of both sides, and I find out x is equal to 8. Let's look at some application. So we have a painter. He's using a 13-foot ladder to paint a house. If there are bushes around the house that force the painter to place his, the base of the ladder five feet from the base of the wall, how high up will the ladder rest on the wall? So I have a picture. Here's the 13-foot ladder. I have five feet away because there's some bushes in there, so I want to know how high can he reach. I can just turn that into a little 513x triangle. The 13 is my hypotenuse, so I want to set up x squared plus 5 squared is 13 squared. I have x squared. 5 squared is 25. And 13 squared is 169. I'm going to subtract. So I have 169. I subtract 25. That gives me 144. And that says x is 12. This time I do have a dimension that these were all in feet, so I can answer that the latter is going to hit 12 feet up. All right, let's look at another application. Let's find the longest diagonal of a rectangle that is eight yards long and three yards wide. So we're inserting this diagonal that's gonna go straight across, All right? What that does, it forms a right triangle because we know all of the corners and it started out as 90 degrees. So you can just pick one of the triangles to look at. So we have 3 and we have 8, and we're looking for the hypotenuse x. So here I want to set up 3 squared plus 8 squared is x squared. I will go on and put the yards um, when we're finished. 3 squared is 9, 8 squared is 64, that gives me x squared. 9 plus 64, that is 73. And then I take the square root. So x, let's do two decimal places, is 8.54 yards. Um, I do this example thinking sometimes they do give dimensions of something, say like a TV. When someone says, how big's your TV? You always give one number, which is kind of weird because there's a length and a width to all TVs, but we always give the diagonal as how big it is. So we might say it's 65 inches or 70 inches or 80 inches if it's really big, right? But we're always giving that diagonal as our measurement. So that's what I did in this picture. Let's make that a tiny bit bigger. Find the longest diagonal that will fit in a room that's 15 feet long, 10 feet wide, and 8 feet high. All right, so this is way different because we're still talking about a diagonal, but notice I gave you three dimensions of the room. So let's look at a picture. When I'm trying to do that, there are two types of diagonals I want to consider. Let's look at actually the one on the right, which is the diagonal face. So we're going to start by looking at the ground, right, and say, well, I could fit a diagonal across the room, which is going to be bigger than either the length or the width of the room. But then once I have that, I could also go up from corner to opposite corner in the room, which is an internal diagonal. So we have to really do this twice when we're trying to figure out what's the longest diagonal of this entire three-dimensional space. Let's go small. So we're gonna start with that first, just look at the ground and see what's happening there. So go back and look, it says the room is 15 feet long and 10 feet wide. So let's just make that rectangle 15 by 10 and say we wanna do this diagonal first. We'll call this X. So I have 10, there's my right angle, here's 15, and here's x. So we're going to set up 10 squared plus 15 squared is going to give me x squared. So 10 squared is 100, 15 squared is 225, and that'll give me x squared. So 100 and 225 is 325 is x squared. So this tells me, take the square root, take the square root. I'm going to do something a little different here. I'm just going to write x is equal to the square root of 325. I'm doing that because I know I'm not done yet. 
I don't want to estimate twice when I'm giving this answer. I don't want to estimate once when I give the answer. So at the very end, when I find my big diagonal for the whole thing, that one will make as a decimal. For this one, I'm just going to hold on to it as the square root of 325. We'll see what that looks like. Okay. So now we're ready to look at the internal diagonal of the room. So we just found this value down here. It's the square root of 325. All right, so I have a triangle. Let's draw it separately. We're looking for this value x, the internal diagonal. We found out this internal diagonal was the square root of 325. And then it says the height of the room is 8 feet. So now I'm going to square 8, I'm going to square with the square root of 325, and that'll give me x squared. So this is, again, why I didn't estimate it already, because 8 squared is 64, the square root of 325 squared is 325, so that works out a lot nicer, it gives me a better number than if I had have done the estimation and turned that into a decimal. We're going to add 64 and 325, that's 389. Now this one, I'm going to take the square root of, so I have, let's write it over here, x is the square root of 389, and let's say that's approximately 19.72, and remember this is in feet, so the biggest diagonal I can do is 19.72 feet. Just as a comparison so we can see, the square root of 325 was 18.03. So if we just gave this bottom diagonal, we would have said it was 18 feet. But by going up to the opposite wall, it was almost really close to 2 feet longer, which is 1972.